Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Mandy Klingelhofer and I'm admissions counselor in RIT's graduate enrollment office. And uh, we just wanted to say congratulations. Congratulations on your admit to RIT's MS computer science program. Uh, we look forward to a great uh, upcoming fall 21 term. So I am joined today by the department, the computer science department. We have uh, director Hans Peter Bischoff with us here today. And we are also joined by two students in the program. We have Aravind and Shwari joining us this morning. Um, so we have definitely um, a lot of people on to go ahead and answer all of your questions this morning. So whether they're admissions questions, program questions, um, questions you wanna to direct to the students, we are definitely here to answer those for you. Um, so before I go ahead and turn it over to the department, um, a few housekeeping notes. Um, first off, we do have that Q&A right in the bottom there. So as I mentioned, um, we are here to answer your questions. So at the end of the presentation, um, we will have plenty of time. So you can go ahead and chat in any of your questions into that Q&A box right there. Um, and we can get to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, we also do have closed captioning this morning. So you can see that feature right in the toolbar there. You can press on that if you'd like to utilize that. Um, we are also recording. So um, you will have access to this presentation. It might not be uh, today or tomorrow. Um, give us a little bit of time, uh, but we will absolutely go ahead and email it out to you so you can uh, reference it at a later date. Um, and then lastly, we are also holding another webinar tomorrow. The Graduate Enrollment Office is hosting another webinar tomorrow morning, um, this exact same time for all um, graduate admitted students to RIT. It's more of a general webinar that talks a little bit more about um, housing, student employment, um, activities on campus, um, but you are welcome to join that webinar if you'd like to learn a little bit more about life um, at RIT. Today, we're gonna focus uh, more so on the computer science program. Um, um, you're welcome to chat in any questions, like I said, um, but we hope to focus more so on the, the curriculum, the program today. Um, and I will go ahead and add into the chat box the webinar for tomorrow. If you would like to join tomorrow's webinar again for the general admitted, I'll add that link into the chat box and you can grab that um, and register for tomorrow's. So um, with that being said, I will go ahead and Turn it over to the department. Again, use that Q&A, chat in any of your questions, um, and we'll get to those at the end. So uh, with that being said, Aravin, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, all. Um, my name is Aravin, and yeah, I'm a graduate computer science student um, at RIT. Um, so I joined RIT at like fall 2018. Um, I had been here for like around two and a half years uh, um, and like I did my co-op, um, I got an opportunity to do a co-op um, from RIT, um, so that was great. Um, so what I like about um, RIT um, is that first, um, I like the weather in New York, um, uh, I like the fall weather especially like um, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't like know before I came to New York that, you know, leaves can actually like, um, can change into that many colors before. And um, I like the snow. Um, I come from a place where it's like hot 24 seven and it's like, it was such a great change in environment for me. Um, and from a career perspective, um, what I like, like about the computer science department is that um, like, as long as you do your hard work, um, you will um, have the opportunity to like, you know, reap your rewards um, and, you know, that might be like get a co-op um, or like, you know, um, uh, do some research um, and like go on to do a PhD. Um, so there are like plenty of opportunities in the computer science department. Um, so that was one thing that I checked before I joined RIT, like is that a track record of students with similar uh, goals achieving their objectives and like the CS department had so many um, career opportunities. Um, so that is something like um, I personally love about the CS department. Um, yeah, so yeah, um, that is a small introduction about me. Thanks, 
so i'll go next um, hi everyone my name is sharbul samke and uh, like arvind i've been at rit since 2018 and um, i will be graduating this semester and yes so that is the gist of it so yeah thank you good morning my name is hans peter bischoff and i also come from a place where it's colder like rochester new york but the language spoken there is German and I happen to be a German. But today we'd like to talk to you as your future program director. I'm the program director of the computer science master's program for 20 some years. So I would assume I know the program rather well. So let's, let's get started. Oops, the button is there. So first I would like to introduce to you a few people you will know and some of you actually have known. First one is Lucienne. When you apply to RIT, your application goes first to Mandy, from Mandy to Lucienne, to me, and from me to Lucienne and back to Mandy. So even the people are not really visible, they are very important for your application and for me working on it. The next two are your future advisors, Rebecca and Cindy. Um, I don't really want to brag about my program or my the advisors, but these are the best advisors at RIT you can find. And I work with them for many, many years, and many students will attest to that, believe me. And they are very important to you. Jason is the person you will see before you see me. Jason is at the front desk, and he's a really nice guy. And he will just tell you, just walk, and you will find my office more or less directly behind him. The last one is Zach Butler, who will be the interim chair by uh, next fall. So this is the team which you will work with at one point in time. Let's talk about the curriculum. The curriculum has required things, the one in red, algorithm and a thesis or a project. Give me a moment, I will tell you what the difference is. The rest of the program is divided into clusters. You have to take three courses from a cluster and everything else is elective. So if your cluster is uh, distributed systems and your friend's cluster is um, AI, then what is for you an elective is for your friend a core course, a cluster course. Why? Well, at one point you will do a capstone project or a thesis and you have to do it in the area in which your cluster is. The idea is if you take three courses in one area, you actually have serious knowledge in this area and your capstone project will be, you know, nice. There will be something discovered. There's also the bridge courses. I come to this in a moment. I assign a bridge course if I see an application and I feel there is a gap between what is needed to pass the grad level courses and what the applicant, what you have, or what you know. Obviously, I could be wrong, right? It's just paper which I analyze. So during orientation, there will be a bridge exam, which will be the equivalent of a final in the courses of the bridge, uh, bridge courses. If you pass them, you have the skills, I was wrong. If you don't, too bad. Then you have to take the bridge courses. But in, in this case, we also know you don't have the skills, what it takes. This is a slightly different form of the curriculum. This is what you will get. If the bridge courses are assigned, these are the typically the three ones which are noted. Then there's a core course, the cluster courses, and the electives. If every box which you need to fill is filled, good to go. You graduate. So let's talk for a moment about the timeline. Let's assume you have to take bridge courses. Why do I assume that? Because most of you have assigned bridge courses. So if you have 12 bridge courses, you have 12 courses to take as a capstone project. At RIT, you cannot take more than four courses in a given term. This would be uh, impossible. It cannot be done. So four courses is tough but doable so it will take you if you take the project path four uh, terms exactly the same amount of time if you take the thesis path the difference is in a project i know the end is at the end of the term 
a thesis has not really a defined ending, so you may go into the summer for a few weeks. But as you can see, it's roughly the same amount of time. If you don't have to take the bridge courses, well, term one kind of disappears, and you can do this in three terms. This is not overly optimistic, this is actually real. Obviously, in this picture, I assume that you are not failing because we are just at the note of failing. So how many students will actually graduate of the ones which I accept into the program? Pretty much all. I suspend, meaning I kick a student out of my program, typically because of academic dishonesty. And these are typically two students per term, not more. If you keep in mind that I have a student population of around 450 students, an incoming class of around 130, two students is a tiny in percentage. So if you actually start my program, the likelihood of you graduating is in the upper 90s percent wise. So what clusters do we have, these ones? We have clusters only if we do active research in this area. Besides the clusters, we also have what's called an advanced certificate. If you take three courses in data management and a additional course in data management, at graduation day, you will be awarded with a CSMS degree and an advanced certificate from RIT. It is possible to take both advanced certificate, but extremely difficult to do, mainly because of scheduling. Um, so if I would be you, and if you're in one of these clusters, I would definitely look into taking one extra course in order to earn this advanced certificate. Last year, we awarded around 60 degrees for data management and the AI is new. So it was the first time that we have it since fall. It will take three or so terms before we are, uh, award the first one. Often I get the question, so which courses can I take? And I could now list the courses for all seven clusters, but I thought that's a tad pointless. I would just like to show you the courses for AI. As you can see, there are many of them. And every course has every cluster has an independent study of option. So you can do an independent study, which is individualized learning with one faculty member, and this can also count towards your cluster. You can find all courses on SIS or on the link which I posted at the bottom. And as Mandy said, this will be posted. If for whatever reason you can find it, drop me a note and it will reply to you. When is the right moment to pick a cluster? Not today and not tomorrow, somewhere at the end of your first term or second term at RIT. There is no reason to overthink this at this point. First of all, keep in mind, a course name is just a course name. You really don't know what's offered in this course. So if I would be you, come to RIT during the first term, try to understand what the cluster actually means, uh, what the people in this cluster are actually doing research-wise, talk to them and then pick a cluster. You can obviously always talk to me about your choice or why you're choosing it, uh, if it's a good idea or bad idea. Students, so I get, as you might imagine, a few emails from potential students. The two top email categories are scholarship and bridge courses. So let's talk about scholarship first. I assign a scholarship at the moment after I accepted an applicant. First decision, accept yes, no. If accept, what scholarship? And the scholarship is only based on your scholarly activity and your, at the end of the day, on your application. If you come to RIT, we assign a scholarship based on your GPA. So let's assume for a moment you have a 30% scholarship and your GPA during the first term is a 3.0. If 
you look at the bottom table, this means you should not actually not have a scholarship. Well, but it was me who had assigned the scholarship and it was me who made the mistake or misjudgment. Therefore, it wouldn't be right to remove your scholarship. In other words, I will never decrease your scholarship. I might increase it, but it will not decrease it. The only moment I will decrease your scholarship is if academic dishonesty, in other words, cheating takes place. But a student who cheats has typically many other issues. Um, I mentioned before, suspension because of academic dishonesty. Yep, this is one of the other issues. So if your application package comes to you and there is nothing mentioned about, scho about scholarship, this means I have not assigned a scholarship to you. This doesn't mean you're not getting one when you are here. We increase the scholarship every year, every term, sorry, I have no idea, 50 students or so, but most students, keep in mind 450 students are in the program, are in the right category of their scholarship. So let's talk for a moment about the cost of the program. This is based on the current academic year. I assume worst case scenario, you have to take three bridge courses. And I assume I award a 30% scholarship. You might imagine I actually analyze the data um, of applicants, how much scholarship has been awarded on average, et cetera. And the average scholarship is actually around 30%. It's 29.5 or something like this, the last time I checked. So the cost overall is $57,000. This is not um, me who made this, made these numbers, they are, they are given to me and I just calculated them for you. Okay. Now let's talk about the bridge program. And I'm speaking here as somebody who actually teaches one of the bridge courses and as somebody who has been at RIT when bridge courses has not been assigned. So what I try to say is speak here with some experience about RIT, not about you. I don't know what you learned at your place. I really have no idea because you come from so many different places, but in no RIT. So if I'm not assigning a school, uh, bridge course and you are not prepared, and you take grad level courses, I guarantee you, you will fail them. And this term will be nightmarish because it's no fun to struggle in a course knowing in week five that you will fail. Then you go back, take some rich courses and we go back again. This makes in my humble opinion, no sense. So if you take the bridge courses, then you take the grad level courses and you will pass them. That's the reason why we have the bridge courses to prepare you, wherever you come from, wherever your education is coming from, to take the graduate level courses. I'm pretty sure you might have a few questions for um, the students who are here. Please ask them about this. Um, so when I teach this course, I have typically hundreds some students in front of me and I know Shavari was in my course and Aravind, I believe, was in my course, but it, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember the lots of students. So please ask them about this. And now I would like to give you a little bit of an example, what I mean with the word knowing Java. You know, knowing Java or a programming language could be you can copy a piece of code and modify it accordingly to your wish list but not quite sure knowing what you're doing, or you can actually absolutely know what you're doing. So some things can be Googled. You can Google many facts, obviously, but the following question, I will show you a program in a bit, and I'm asking you, is this program printing only out 0101? It will be a very short piece of code. Let's take a look at it. So I have here, as you can see, a static object. I assume for a moment you know Java, at least to some degree, right? So this means there is one object uh, shared amongst any zero, one or so objects, as we know. So I create two objects, call them one and zero, 
send start. They go into the run method. Let's assume zero goes first. Can go into synchronized block because it's the first one. Says notify to nobody. Prints out zero, goes into wait. This is the moment when the thread number one goes in. Can go in because the <clears throat> other one is in the wait. Says notify, this will release the other one. Prints out one, goes into wait. One is now, uh, sorry, zero is now going and prints out and so on. I'm pretty sure you see the picture. This happens to be nice, but it's unfortunately incorrect. It's really incorrect. So let me show you the same program in a slightly different version. The only thing what I modified is I put in here a sleep. What is happening? The first is created, goes in, creates a new object. Let's call this object, object zero. Goes in, is synchronized on object zero, prints out object zero, goes in and notify to object zero, prints out zero, sleeps. This sleep here is only to slow down the execution of the code. Otherwise it just flies by and then waits. The other one after a tiny sleep is now created, shows up in this constructor after the first one, now creates an object one, let's call it object one. So the two objects used for the synchronization are completely different. This means it can go in a synchronized block, says notify to object one, object zero, it really doesn't care about this, goes into a sleep. And now let's execute this piece of code. And that's exactly what's happening. This is what I mean with knowing Java. Looking at this code and without any doubt, understanding what is happening. Actually writing this piece of code, looking at it is one thing. So that's what I mean with Java. You can also find my Java notes of the course from last term on my webpage, type in my name in Google and it will come up. All homeworks, all exams and solutions are posted there. Feel free to go over them. This was an animation, which I don't need anymore. So for fall, if you have to take the bridge courses, these are the ones. We will pre-register you. You don't have to worry about anything. You will get on a regular basis email, which you already have gotten from Cindy and Rebecca. And we will continue this. So you will be informed what is happening. If you have to take only two bridge courses, we should communicate about what is the third one. If you have to take no bridge course whatsoever or only one, talk to me. We will find out which course is best for you. You can just send me a note and I will register you as soon as I can, as I can do this, okay? So one of the questions is also how many jobs and can I get a job at RIT? Well, first of all, we do have 10 TAs. You can apply for a TA position if you are physically here in Rochester, New York and take classes. Why? If you come here and you are a TA, you are required to work 20 hours a week. Do you really have these 20 hours a week free? I would guess at this point, you have really no idea. If you would be a TA and you would actually struggle with your coursework, and I'm pretty sure you might, then you also will struggle as a TA and you will most likely fail your courses. This is not, makes no sense in my opinion. So you can apply in fall, in spring, and again in fall, because we hire you for a year. You're here for four uh, terms if you are if you have to take the bridge courses, so you have three chances to apply. We also have around 12,000 students who work at RIT in different places, as greater in the dining facilities. We have 17,000 students or so, so it looks like pretty much two thirds of them, a bit more than that, are working somewhere at RIT. Um, Co-op. Most of my students go on two co-ops. Normally we have a job fair which takes place twice a year and there are typically 200 some companies. I believe the last time it was 220 or 250 employers. 
This year, because of COVID, we have uh, virtual um, job fairs. And I have at this point no understanding, no idea what we'll do in fall. RIT will open in fall more or less as planned, at least I would hope so. But it's very difficult, as we know, to predict the future. Most of the students go on their co-op to the West Coast, Boston, New York City area, and pretty much all over the US. But these are the three main spots. Most students pay part of their education with, with these co-ops. It's an hourly paid job. Uh, the average is around $30. And our students are sought after, especially when I read the evaluation and I read personally all of them. The student evaluations from the employer are excellent. Um, so how about employment? Typically a student asks me, so how much money can I make? And my typical answer is that's actually irrelevant. The money you make has a lot to do with where you are. If you make $80,000 in Rochester, this is significant. This allows you to have a significantly higher standard of living compared to you make $80,000 in New York City. So additionally to this, costs as the benefits are relevant. That's a really complicated problem and I really don't want to go too deep into this. But if I look at the Facebook uh, of my former students, I have around thousands or more, I haven't checked for quite a while now. And what they post, it appears to me they have a reasonably high standard of living. And that's the best I can say what my students make. I know as a fact, the student who started in Rochester last year, his, uh, uh, the student's starting salary was 80K. If you start at the West Coast um, and you don't make plus $100,000 in your first year plus a signing bonus, there's something wrong. These are the numbers, but there are tools which allow you to figure out what a computer science master student from RIT makes and what this means. This actually leads me to my last, press, uh, my last slide. Any questions you might have? Professor Bishop, that was really great and very helpful. Thank you so much. We're getting a lot of questions coming in the background that we um, have been able to answer some of them, um, but we will go ahead and um, ask you some of them, Professor Bischoff and Erevin and Shwari to help answer as well. Um, while we're reading over some of those though, um, Erevin, Shwari, do you wanna each talk a little bit about your experience um, with co-op, RIT's career fair, Erevin, I know you, you talked a little bit about it initially. Um, do you wanna elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, sure. Um, so RIT's career services um, provide some excellent, you know, um, tips and uh, like opportunities to network and find co-ops as well as full-time opportunities. Um, so when I came in, um, like, um, for my first two semesters, we had this huge um, career fair. Um, and like, like, I had a huge amount of opportunities to basically like learn how to speak with um, employers and how to interview um, in my first career fair. And in my second career fair, I had like opportunities to actually apply for co-ops and internships. And um, like, I gained a lot of experience um, from those two career fairs. Um, I got my co-op. Um, by networking and using RIT's um, resources. Um, and I know a friend of mine um, who basically got a co-op um, by like, you know, networking with alumni and uh, using RIT's um, career services as well. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities for you. Um, uh, from my experience, I did a co-op for two terms. Um, so the CS department does allow you to do co-ops for two terms. Um, I know I saw a few questions regarding um, like how long it typically takes you to finish your um, master's um, if you uh, you know um, do a co-op for a single term or like say a two term co-op. Um, that's going to depend on how you basically plan your um, master's. Um, I know, uh, for example, I did two term co-op. Um, I had to take a few summer courses so that I can actually like graduate uh, before May, 2021. Um, um, I know people who did like a co-op and they did like one, one course um, while doing a co-op. 
um, and they were able to like graduate a bit more earlier. Um, so it really depends whether you are gonna take a summer course and how you plan about going, um, like basically like how you plan your masters. So do communicate with your advisors um, and um, like, you know, and I mean like just um, jot out of, uh, I would say uh, some kind of a plan um, for your masters, um, if you uh, if you plan on doing a co-op, um, so that's basically uh, my experience. Um. That's really great. Thank you, Shwari. Do you have any uh, any experience that you could add? So, like Arvin said, so uh, we were actually like uh, I was suggested by Cindy, our advisor, that we should. So I wasn't confident initially to talk to the. Um, recruiters so we were suggested that first term or the first um, virtual interview or the first career fair we had just talk to everyone so that you get to know even though you don't apply just know what they want and just be yourself and after that there are actually resources like RIT's Career Connect where you can schedule mock interviews you can give your resume ask them to check it and They'll tell you if it's good, what you need to add, or the things you need to focus on. And you, after you schedule your mock interview, they ask you behavioral questions. They give you a feedback in a day or two, and you can utilize it for your next interviews. You can even schedule in mock interviews. I mean, record yourself and tell, uh, send the video to them, and they'll send you a feedback. And there are actually very uh, a lot of resources and. I'll suggest just to make use of the resources because you have them in it and just apply to everything. Just uh, use those opportunities because you don't realize it sometimes uh, by yourself and don't like it's better to start using, uh, better to start applying early than regretting it later. So that is it. Yep. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. We're getting a lot of questions about the co-op, so that information uh, will certainly be beneficial. Um, going along with that, one of the questions right now for the co-op, are um, the co-ops always paid or are they sometimes unpaid? Co-ops have to be paid. You don't okay. work for free. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that is correct. Your co-ops, yep, are a paid position. Um, and you would certainly coordinate with our Office of Co-op and Career Services, as both Aravin and Shuari mentioned. Um, they're a great resource, a great department to help you, um, you know, with the skills um, for interviewing the um, positions that are available and um, typical pay ranges that might be out there. So yes, your co-ops are a paid position and generally um, a full-time position as well too. So, um, okay, a lot more questions coming in. So let's see here. On the contingency form in my admit letter, it was indicated that I need to complete um, 603, 605, and 661 for the bridge courses. Are these all separate courses? Yes, those are three separate courses that you do take and are typically um, completed in that first semester when you arrive. So for fall, those will be your three courses that you'll be completing. You do not need to um, take these courses in advance. I know that's a common question. Um, they are here on campus um, that first semester and those are your three classes. Okay, let's see. Um, I know you answered this already, Professor Bischoff, but we have a student here. Would I be eligible eligible for a scholarship after the first semester based on the GPA if I did not get one at the point of admission? You would be eligible for it. Correct. Uh, where can I find more information about rest, the best resources to prepare for the bridge course exams? I will post this in the chat. Thank you. The link in the chat room, which is titled Bridge Test Information. This gives you an idea what these courses are cover and 
Um, most of the courses are not publicly available. My course is, so you can go to my web page and study for 605. That's the best information I have for you. Okay, and when would we decide on our capstone? When do we decide between a project or a thesis? Somewhere in week in term three, I would assume. So this is a decision which you can wait for quite a bit. Okay, and um, going back to the bridge courses, um, is there a syllabus or a pattern regarding the bridge courses? That's is that information in the link that you provided, Professor Bishop? This information is in the link. If Perfect. you wonder about the structure of the bridge exams, this is not multiple choice. I can I know you might have access to the World Wide Web or not. It doesn't matter. All the questions are like the program I have shown you and tell me what it does and why. So the bridge exams, we, we tend at RIT not to do multiple choice questions. Okay, and bridge courses, are they mandatory for everyone? You would have received in your admit package a contingency form. If they were noted on that contingency form, um, then they are required for you. You do have that option, as Professor Bischoff said, to test out of them with the bridge waiver exam. Um, but again, if you do have them noted on your admit letter, then they are required for you. In case we have bridge courses, how many courses are in total the first semester? The bridge courses are your first semester, so that would be the three courses noted. Um, what is the typical length of a co-op? Typical length would be one semester, Professor? So there are regulations about co-ops, about work, working in the US if you're not a US citizen. And a co-op is from a time point of view equivalent to a term. The typical co-op starts at the beginning of a term and ends at the end of a term. There is maybe a few days here or there, but that's a general rule. If I take a co-op, is it a three-year program then, or what would be the length to complete the program if I also have bridge courses and a co-op? Aravind, would you be so kind? You're muted. Um, so um, as I talked about previously, um, it, it depends um, whether on whether you like do your summer courses or you take a course while doing your co-op. Um, like again, from my experience, um, I did like uh, two terms of co-op. Um, I did like two summer courses. Um, I did a course while doing the co-op uh, for my spring term and I'll be graduating in May, 2021. Um, I did like three courses um, for the rest of the semesters. Um, so it depends on a lot of things um, like um, maybe like if if you if you are like if you have like a high GPA um, and if you are given permission to do like four courses per term, um, that is like sometimes very rare. Um, but um, if you are given like a chance, maybe you can like try to complete it earlier. But that's again really rare. Um, so again, like plan it out earlier. Um, I I know sometimes like um, um, you don't know whether you're gonna get a co-op or not um, for that term or like for. Um, so, like, I would just say, um, once you decide on doing the co-op and once you have an offer at your hand, um, plan it out earlier, discuss with your advisor, um, and see whether you're eligible to do a, um, like, you know, a course while doing a co-op, as well as if you're eligible to do summer courses. Um, like, that's my uh, basic advice. Um, so, it's, it's, it, it's going to vary from student to student. Thank you, Aravind. Okay, lots more questions that we're reading through here. Um, 
Professor Bischoff, what is the typical batch size for the computer science um, students, and is it difficult to get electives of your preference? Typical incoming class size for fall is around 130 students. Our courses fill up. So there are courses which are more sought after. And let's assume you're looking to take this course in spring and for whatever reason it doesn't work out. The next one you will most likely get this course is the following fall. Yes, there is a bit of an issue but I can also tell you we are hiring at this point four more faculty to open more course slots as we currently have. The last year's incoming class size was smaller based on COVID, so the situation for the coming years should be better. Okay, let's see here. Um... Professor Bischoff, do most all students pass the bridge exams um, the first time around? Uh, maybe the student should answer, Shavari. So I am one of the examples where no, I didn't pass in the first uh, attempt. But um, the first attempt, uh, you learn a lot in the first attempt. So you typically do good or very good uh, like I would say for all my other friends who are repeating. So you do get through it and uh, it is not difficult. You probably struggled in the first semester and you are accustomed to the questions. You know what kind of questions are asked. You know the concepts, the concepts are clear. So yes, you get through it in the second time. Aravind, would you like to say a few words about the bridge exam? Yeah. Um, so, um, my experience is kind of like uh, a bit more on the sense that it's not different from Shivari, um, but my background is um, basically like I did my undergrad in electrical engineering and I didn't have like any experience in computer science. Um, so for me, bridge courses were an absolute essential, um, basically like one of the reasons um, I, I was inclined to join RIT was because of the bridge courses. Um, I was actually looking into courses, I mean programs. Um, that had some kind of a bridge course. Um, it may be like a term long bridge course or something uh, similar to that. Um, so I actually did not did not take the uh, bridge course exam because for me it was like more mandatory. I just wanted to take the uh, bridge courses first and actually like gain more experience from that. Um, but I would advise you to take the bridge course exams even if you're coming from a different background just to like, you know, um, get the feel for it. Um, and I don't know, maybe like if you're actually really good and uh, uh, if you get lucky, maybe you can actually pass the exam as well, so. So to the question, how many, sorry, to the question, how many pass the A bridge exam, pretty much nobody. I know this sounds terrible, but that's the truth. Why yeah, is this actually a good thing? Sorry, Mindy. No, 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 sorry, go ahead. If you, if you go into something difficult like the computer science master's degree and you don't have the foundation, you will just not make it. I know this sounds so awkward and strange, but believe me for a moment, I'm doing this for many, many years. I teach this course, Java, and my students think I'm doing a reasonably good job. When I ask you, when you apply for a job, and there are questions regarding Java and you and I, and you cannot compete with me, then you already lost the job. And my goal as a professor, as your program director is to put you in a situation where you are more than competitive than anybody else from any other schools. And I know as a fact, my students get jobs where students from Stanford, Harvard, et cetera, apply because they are better. In order to get better than anybody else, you have to learn. And this is not easy. I was a student once. I know how this is. These courses, if you don't have the skill set, are essential. Two years ago, a other graduate school kicked out 80% of the students with one simple statement. They cannot code after the first term. This caused such an uproar that the university had to change their division, decision. 
they had should have known this beforehand. So these courses, as Aravind said, are essential for you if you have to take them. If you pass the bridge exams, wonderful. But this is not expected. Thank you. Sorry, Mandy. No, no, no. No, it was actually um, right along with that as well, too. Um, a lot of questions about when the bridge course exams are conducted and when will they'll receive information about that. They will be done in the in orientation. Orientation typically takes place one week before we start. And exams are typically Monday or Tuesdays. This depends a bit on the remaining on the schedule around our schedule. But you will get information about this well in advance. And if they do not pass the bridge courses in the first attempt, if they only need to take one or two more in the next semester, would they take one or two more bridge courses and then a regular course within the program? That's exactly correct. You can take all the courses, you have the prereq knowledge for it. Okay. Um, is Java the only one we are targeting or can we have the language of our choice? Well, maybe I should be a bit more clear. Java is a vehicle. I use Java to explain to you concepts, how to write code. And the faculty as a whole has decided that Java is the language we are using most often. And therefore I use Java. I could also use C sharp, scheme, prolog, not prolog, maybe not. Uh, Modular 2, Pascal, all of these languages are as good as others, but we have chosen Java. When are academic advisors assigned to students and when should we start reaching out to them? They are assigned to you at the moment you paid your deposit because they are assigned by last name. I would recommend to reach out to your advisor a few weeks before classes start, or if you have really a question which you can't find the answer to. Okay, let me see here. What percentage of the class gets a co-op and or a full-time position upon graduation? Uh, my guess is close to 100%. Everybody, I mean, depends on who wants a co-op. There are students who told me they are just not interested in a co-op. But based on the number of co-op reports I read, it must be an enormous amount of. I mean, I read per year 200 some co-op reports. And a full-time position upon graduation? I know no student who is unemployed. Great. Um, how competitive is it to become a TA or a student worker within the department? So we hire the best students we can find. For a TA position, we have around 80 applications a term, and we hire the best five we can find. Is this really competitive? Well, for one faculty position, we had 160 applications. So I'm not quite sure what you mean with competitive, but it's for sure not the case that everybody who applies gets a TA position. For greater positions, this is up to the faculty I typically send an email out saying I'm looking for graders for Java. This course might be a bit different than others, but I get for around 10 positions around 80 to 100 applications. Okay, and a couple questions on classes for fall. Classes begin usually always around mid-August. I believe the schedule anticipated for this year, I want to say, is starting Classes start the first day on August 23rd, I want to say, but typically it's mid-August is when our fall term starts. Um, okay. 
can I decide to take the bridge courses directly and not even attempt to take the waiver exams? Yeah, of course. This is what most people, most students are doing. Do I need to register for the first term classes, the bridge courses, or are they automatically done for me? As I said during the presentation, they're automat you're automatically registered for the bridge courses. Um, okay, let's see. Is there a typical average GPA upon graduation of the students in the program? So students who graduate can also be can also apply to be the, the graduate delegate. We had last time a class of around 140 students graduating. 60 had a GPA of three, six or higher because they are, they are eligible. So I know this particular number. My guess is the average GPA in my department is around a three, four, three, three, somewhere in this neighborhood. Is there a minimum GPA to do a co-op? 3.0. And to go along, along with that, co-ops um, for international students, um, you have to be a student here on campus for the um, first two semesters, typically the nine months um, before you're eligible to do a co-op, but you still work with your department to determine when is a good time to do a co-op during your program. Um, how, what is RIT planning for fall 2021? Online, hybrid, in person? What is the plan so far? The plan so far is all three. We plan to have classes in person, we plan to have classes hybrid, and we plan to have courses online. The reason why we plan this way, this gives us the most flexibility. Nobody knows what, how fall will look like, so we are planning for every possible situation. Is it possible to convert from an MS program to a PhD program at a later stage? Possible, yes, but the person who decides this is the PhD program director. It is a rare situation, I believe. I have never heard that a student starts an MS, doesn't complete it, and moves into a PhD program. Okay. All right, we have a few more minutes here and we still have a lot of questions coming in. So we're gonna go through them as best as we can here. Um, are we allowed to take elective courses from another school or does everything have to be completed at RIT? There is a list of courses which is published in the handbook, which tells, which describes which courses you can take, which are not in the CS program. If there is a pressing reason why you would like to take a course from another program and count it to, towards your MS degree, you need my written permission. Typically I grant it, but you have to have a reason for it. Um, are there career fairs specifically for only CS students? No, career fairs are for all students at RIT. Um, okay, so this is an interesting question here. Maybe Aravin Shwari. Does the co-op program create competitive tension in the student culture? Um, I would say not really. There are a lot of opportunities out there. Um, I mean, like from a competitive point of view, I would say it's, it's all healthy. Um, there are like usually like 
um, that are students who will help you out. Um, like I typically, I stayed in a household. Um, all of my roommates were um, computer science students. Um, so we basically like used to sit together and, you know, um, like apply and discuss about coding challenges and things that we get during our interviews. Um, so, um, so I wouldn't say it's like, you know, competitive in the sense that it's all healthy. Um, um, it's not like um, uh, really, it's, it's, it's not about you pulling someone's leg and like, you know, um, and things like that, things like that. It's not, um, uh, um, I would say, competitive in a bad kind of way. Um, so it, um, yeah, and it's typically speaking, co-op opportunities are competitive, not within like, um, within the department itself. Um, like you'll be competing with a lot of different um, universities as well. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities out there. Um, so I, I, I would say you should not focus on that. You should focus on like basically um, improving yourself, be good at data structures and algorithms and just have what it takes to pass those coding interviews um, and the rest will come. Great, thank you. And we have another question here directly for Shwari and Aravind as well too. Um, can you quickly tell us some resources that we can start for now to prepare to prepare for those um, interviews and job positions? I, I'm not sure. Uh, so usually the RIT career services are avail available once you get your uh, email ID and you set your password. And anything you want to access basically on RIT, anything related to RIT or RIT's website, any website, would be accessible through those websites. I mean, if you're talking about the RIT career services. So once you get your email ID, you set your password, uh, I think you'll be able to access anything. The, the site is RIT Career Connect for now. And if you get your email ID and password set, you can go check out the resources. And for now, since we don't have career fairs, we have virtual career sessions or information session, sessions as they're called. So you can check out those as well. And uh, uh, when you start your semesters, I would say just keep a lookout for the career services emails, which typically start after a month or so, I, I'd say. And apart from that, I'll say uh, RIT newsletters have uh, news related to things going on campus. So there's usually a hackathon somewhere happening. You can register for that. So there was a brick hack, a brick hack, a hackathon called brick hack last Saturday, Sunday. So you can participate, you can volunteer. Um, there's one for women I know, which is a woman uh, WIC hacks. So RIT has a woman in computing, uh, a small team of women who are computer science engineers. And it is very interesting. And I would suggest for all the women out there to attend the WIC hacks because it gives you a perspective and just enroll and join these uh, hackathons because you learn a lot. Even if you don't win anything, you meet new people, you talk to the recruiters and there's always free stuff. So yes. Great, thank you. Really good information. <laughs> um, okay, looking at some of these questions that are coming in here. Um, any specific material we need to prepare in advance for the bridge courses? Um, I would recommend read the information described in the link I sent to you. Okay. Um, scholarship questions here, um, which we have seen before in the past, Professor Bischoff, for a student wondering, I have the same GPA as a friend of mine who received a scholarship, but I did not. Um, is there a reason why I did not receive them and can I get one in a future term? So the GPA of a transcript covers everything what there is. So let's assume your friends got all A's in all computer science related environments and you got all C's, but your overall GPA is a 3.5. Clearly, the transcript with all A's, I rate significantly higher. Secondly, I'm not only as evaluating the transcript, I'm evaluating a letter of, uh, of 
purpose, your statement of purpose, letters of references, everything there is. And then I try to make the best possible decision I can do. Thank you, Professor. What about research assistantship positions at RAT? Can we apply for them? Of course, but research assistantship positions are controlled by the faculty, not by me. So typically you need to be in a faculty's class so he or she knows you and then you can apply for a position, for an AR position. Can you talk about the student population for the CS program at RIT? Is it very diverse? Um, based on my evaluation, these are roughly 87% students from India. The rest is from all over the world. I have, best to my knowledge, no student from Europe. I would argue it's a pretty diverse group, but it's mainly students from India, second group is China, third group is US. Are there any clubs or activities specifically for CS students? Yes, well, I am the host of one club, it's a, it's a greater, it's a great, it's a, computer, it's a, it's a Google formed club. Um, I have no idea if there are other ones. Sharavi, what do you know? Um, I'm not sure uh, about typical, just for um, computer science students, but there are clubs like the artificial intelligence club or the Linux, uh, RIT lab, uh, the Linux club, which have meetings typically on Fridays for one or two hours. And there was one for the operating systems, if I remember, like a year back on Slack. But other than that, um, yeah, I think those are the ones. Um, I would recommend that you are actually looking for clubs which are not CS focused. You need to do something else besides coding. Okay, I wanna be mindful of everybody's time here. It's been over an hour. So we'll answer a couple more questions, but I do wanna remind everybody because I'm seeing a lot of questions in here that are about um, some of that general information about RIT, like the um, visas or submitting the, the documents to obtain the visa or um, OPT. So just a reminder that tomorrow morning, again, nine o'clock tomorrow morning, we are hosting a general RIT um, webinar just like this, the Graduate Enrollment Office is hosting that, and a lot of those questions will be addressed in that presentation. Anything from um, working on campus to co-ops to um, general life at RIT, all of that. So I would encourage you to join uh, tomorrow's webinar. The link is posted in that chat where you can register. Um, and if you're unavailable for that, we do host those typically once or twice a month. So there is certainly more opportunity. Um, so with that being said, um, I would say a couple last questions here. Um, based on how we do in the bridge course, does that have any effect on our um, options for clusters after we're done with the bridge courses? No, there is no such thing like a conditional pass. If you pass the course, it doesn't matter with an A or a B, you have the same selection opportunities as anybody else. There's really no difference. And again, total graduation if a student has uh, bridge courses and a co-op. Is that two and a half years? What would you say, HP? Well, as Aravind said before, it depends highly if you take courses during the summer, during the 
co-op time, but I would say a good number is between two and three years. Perfect. Are there any um, past projects or thesis um, documents posted through your website or online that students can view? They are posted on the CSMS part of our website. Go for go to the web page, look for graduate student, look for res, uh, resources, and scroll down. And somewhere at the bottom, there are old projects or projects from the past. But Aravind and Sharari are just doing two with me, so you could also ask ask them. Oh, perfect. Do either of you guys want to share any information about the project you're working on? Sure. Um, so um, I'm doing a project, a caption project with uh, Professor Bischoff. And, and my project is based on sentiment analysis um, on social media for COVID-19 and vaccinations on COVID-19. Um, so it's a it's kind of like a data science, it's, it is a data science project where like um, I basically collect data from Twitter um, and like, you know, do pre-processing and cleaning of the data um, and basically um, do an exploratory data analysis as well as a sentiment analysis. Um, so I mean, I was right in the middle of doing that today morning as well. So uh, it's fun. Uh, Rory, what is your project about? So my project is in the intelligent systems cluster and it's basically portfolio optimization but using uh, machine learning. And I'm trying to investigate portfolios for companies. For now, it's just top 30, like five out of top 30 in the from the NASDAQ index. And I'm trying to um, optimize their portfolios for the companies and looking into what resources or what diversification will give them uh, higher profits. Yeah. Okay, let's see here. Professor Bischoff, are there any uh, last minute questions that you see there that you would like to address or anything that you would like to um, pass along to the students? Yeah, let me just go through the list. So what about the tuition waivers for TA and RA? So if we hire a TA, this person gets 75% scholarship and a stipend, a monthly stipend. An RA person is paid by a faculty member from his or her grant. This is individually and it's unknown to me. Um, would an applicant be able to grab scholarship if he or she clears the Java waiver exam? No. The scholarship decision is based on your overall application. The likelihood that you pass the Java waiver exam, just to reiterate, is not large, it's small. Last fall, where we had an online Java uh, bridge exam, zero students passed. Um, okay, the rest are financial documents. Can we undertake both and in? How can we connect to Professor Bishop? First of all, I would prefer to spell my name correctly. My last name is spelled B-I-S-C-H-O-F. We have a course questions related to our courses. You can obviously send an email to me. My email address can be found either on my website. If you can't find this, please type in Bishop Hans Peter in Google and it will get you there. I see a question here for Aravind um, directly. What is your, since you're doing data science capstone, is your cluster big data or intelligent systems? Um, it's big data. A lot of questions about TA positions, RA positions. Um, I think Professor Bischoff um, and the students have, have covered that as far as um, how those are determined and applying for those upon arrival at RIT. Uh, 
Uh, yes, can we take classes during summer break? Um, I and Aravin to discuss this as well. Yep, it depends on when you do your co-op. You might do a co-op over the summer break, uh, but you can also um, take a course as well along with your co-op. Um, there are typically options for courses over summer break, correct? Yes. yes. So there's one question about capstone project with teams or single students. This depends on the advisor. What you have to show as a student, what was your contribution to science? So you can't do a project together and submit the same report, but it's up to the faculty member. Uh, financial documents required for the I-20. Uh, that information is in your admission packet. You should have um, an international student visa information sheet and it'll tell you there what needs to be submitted. Um, and once you submit that information, it comes to our office and then we will then in turn process the I-20. If we have any questions regarding the information you submitted, we will reach out to you. All right, it looks through, it looks like we've gotten through most all of the questions here. Um, let's see. How can we connect with Professor Bischoff? As he said, um, it's right on his website. So if you go to the RIT um, program webpage for computer science, his contact information is right on that page. Um, my contact information is on that page as well. So if you have specific questions um, about your uh, application or, um, you know, wondering if you were assigned the bridge courses, which you should see that on your contingency form, but you're welcome to email me directly. My contact information is on there. So there's one question. Do internship co-op provide full-time jobs? More often than not, um, the companies where a student does an internship offers a offers a full-time job if the student decides to apply there. There's a question about interested, I'm interested in cloud computing, which professor can I contact from RIT? Uh, with this, I would actually wait until you are here. In which year are we starting to work on our capstone project? In your last term. You might do some work a term before in the independent study or so, but it's typically done in your last term. So before we, my last words are actually, so you might not know this, but today is what's called a rest day at RIT where students should actually rest. I didn't know that this open house is actually on a rest day. So I would like to thank Aravind and Shavari for their time with, with you answering your questions. Thank you so much. If you have further questions, please send email to Mandy or myself and we will answer it as quickly as we can. Yes, okay. thank you, Shwari and Aravind. I noticed that last night as well too. So I appreciate you joining on your rest day. Um, to everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations again on your admit. Just a reminder, deposits um, are due absolutely no later than May 1st. Um, the sooner the better is great, um, but the end date to pay that deposit is May 1st. So um, we did put the link in the chat for tomorrow's webinar. If you wanna join that, it's in there. Yes, HP. Sorry, can I ask one question? It has nothing to do with this program. One of my students claims there are currently large power outages in India. Can anybody confirm that there are large power outages in India or not? Okay, thank you so much. All um, right, goodbye everybody. Thank you again. Okay, thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.